First of all, then, my Father's glory. It is, says Jesus, to my Father's glory. And you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus, and you couldn't mistake the issue at all, is always very enthusiastic about his Father's glory. He's not very enthusiastic about his own glory, where he could be. I mean, he is the firstborn over all creation, after all. You know, he's in a better, he's, he's a better position than the rest of us to start with. He's very enthusiastic about his Father's glory and attributing glory to another. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the glory of God, right? So, what, what, what have we got? Callum, what's the glory of God? Don't put me on the spot. Don't put me on the spot. Well, there's a clue on the screen that I was, you know, trying to put you on the spot. The glory of God? Yeah. The glory of God is the bright, shining splendor. Of God. We can do better than that. R.C. Sproul his book on the holiness of God. He says, God's glory is the outward manifestation of his holiness. The effulgence, that's a good word. The, <coughs> the effulgence of his glory is so scintillating, so brilliant, that it eclipses the noonday sun. Now, here's a word to work in at school, okay? Effulgence. <laughs> it, means, it means the bright shining out. Wow! What? Oh, I'll start that again, shall I? <coughs> it means the great big outshining, outpouring, glorious, radiating, shining wonder, splendor of God. Yeah, but what? What's the word? Oh, sorry, okay, I'll start that again. Effulgence. Two F's. Effulgence. 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 Wow. His glory is so scintillating, so brilliant, it eclipses the noonday sun. And Sproul got on to talk about Paul on Damascus Road, you know? And he's walking along, and it's, it's at noon, isn't it? Now, if you're walking along a road through a desert to Damascus, in a brilliant sun, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of sun, there's a lot of radiance about, and all of a sudden, something that so completely surpasses the brightness of the noonday sun in the desert shines, and it's the presence of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <coughs> he talks about Paul on the Damascus road, he talks about the light of the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21, where the whole city needs no light. Remember we looked recently at Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. We talked about the lights in the temple at Jerusalem during the feast. Yeah. Shining out of all the windows, shining, shining out throughout the whole place. Well, the light of the new Jerusalem is the glory of the Lamb. The glory of the Father and the Lamb. They're the light of the place. So in the Bible, God's glory is the umbrella catch-all term for a splendor, majesty, power that is so bright and outstanding that it shines like a piercing blinding light. <clears throat> we sing about you know, the glory of the King, robed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. And whilst that's what's getting referred to like that, it's, it's not the word that's being used here. What we're dealing with here is a verb, to glorify. And here's an interesting one. God is there in his glory, right? He's got that glory. That's what he's like, that's what he is, that's what he's about. And here says Jesus, what you ought to do, this is to my Father's glory, right? That you do this. So what he's calling on the followers of Christ to do is to glorify the one whose glory already burns brighter than the noonday sun, etc., etc., and all the things we've been talking about. How do you do that? Is that a puzzler? I mean, if he's got all that glory already, what is me bearing fruit? going to do to add to his glory? Miller, reflection. <laughs> I'm not very good at reflecting that sort of glory. <laughs> oh no, we're not. <laughs> I'm not I had a problem with this for years. How do you glorify the Lord with me? How am I going to glorify him? Well, it's like this, isn't it? His glory burns like the noonday sun, doesn't it? But the, the noon is not statically, but the, the sun is not statically brilliant, is it? The sun is dynamically brilliant. It goes on with all that stuff that's happening with hydrogen atoms being collided together and making helium and burning in the sun. It's, a, it's not a static glory that God's got. It's a dynamic glory that God's got. It's an ongoing, moving, functioning thing. And, and so often you read the theology books and they talk about God as having a sort of static idea of his glory. But God's glory is dynamic. It doesn't just sit there. It lives. It moves. It is daily. And it does stuff. On that basis, even I, through doing what you know, this verse here, saying that, some big brick little way, I'm contributing to the, the dynamic glory of God. That's deep, isn't it? It's a bit deep for Sunday morning, isn't it? You know. But I thought a bit, I thought, well, I've had this problem before, so I'll just I'll throw that into the mix and see how they respond. 
Christians live to display that dynamic glory of God. Now, newsflash, that's what the Christian lives for. <clears throat> We're looking at, you know, if you pass that bit of Greek, you'll find it there, and Aristotle is passive. We're definitely doing it to him. But we're doing it in response to who he is and what he is. It's a response, a dynamic response called forth, forth from people, being done to him, not by him. We are glorifying God. It is a response called forth by appreciation of the excellency that is his on an ongoing basis. And that's what arises out of the life of discipleship, life in the vine, bearing fruit for God. Our thing is the change that's taking place in a person's fundamental, aspirational, motivational centre of gravity when they become a Christian. Because human life in its natural state is hyper concerned with glory. But human life in its natural state is hyper concerned with its own glory, isn't it? We're concerned about our reputation, we're concerned about what the other person's going to think about us, we're concerned about what the other student in college is going to think whether I'm cool or not. And it's hard to follow Christ if you're going to be bound by that. Because there are times when following Jesus is going to look pretty not cool to a godless person. Human life in its natural state is hyper-concerned with its own glory. We really do want to be the uber-cool. It's a real spiritual problem, isn't it? I, I, think, I think it alienates a lot of people from church, actually, when you've got an uber-cool church. Because, I was saying to some of the students the other week, you know, you can't afford to be too cool for school, or as we call it, church. Right? You've got to be prepared to get that dirty, uncool, hands grubby thing that, uh, that Christ made. This sort of self-glorification by followers of Christ, look how cool I am, it runs counter to essential truths that underlie the truths at the heart of the Christian gospel. The heart of the Christian gospel is I'm not very cool. And there you are, you go to Twitter and Facebook and all of the student work and right throughout the large successful city churches of our land and amongst all those elsewhere who long to be like that, chasing cool. And chasing cool might be cool with the godless, but it's not with the Lord we follow because his followers live for his glory, not theirs. Does that make sense? And that's the key thing here. It is precisely living for His glory, not ours, that is the subject of these verses. It's all about His glory, not ours. And we live to display that glory. So what does Jesus say about what will bring Him glory? Bearing fruit will bring Him glory. Let me remind you of the illustration Jesus is working through here. He's working through that earlier allusion to the vine, to the grape plant. The grape. Oh, that's disappointing. It's a bit dull, grape plant. It's a bright room, and we've got a oh, fairly dark grape plant. That's a lovely, that's quite a lovely grape plant in reality. Here's how it goes. The life is in the rootstock, picking up nutrients and feeding them through. Picking up on Isaiah's prophecy there about salvation and the stump that comes out of Jesse, okay? It's Christ. And unbelieving Jews and Gentiles both get grafted onto that strong rootstock when they turn from sin and trust in Christ. But the rootstock is there to provide the nutrient, but the grafting is there to bear the fruit on the branches. Yeah, make it sense? We've done this, we know this. The life that's in the rootstock then flows to the grafted branches as the sap rises through them, and it gives life and it gives fruit to the branches. The business of those branches then is not to go off working up fruit on their own, but to guard the graft to the rootstock, Christ himself. And see that they therefore suck up the sap that gives life and produces fruit in due season with nothing without it. A branch is no good without a root stock. <coughs> so we need a good healthy branch to draw on the life that's in Christ and we aim at that, that's what we aim at, and then produce the fruit that that fuels. If you short circuit the process and go, I'm going to go bear fruit and try and do it without your root stock, you are stuck. Okay? Go and bear fruit from that root stock. So many of the sermons that I, I hear about bearing fruit for God, they're a bit like that. Can you see that poor donkey? If you ever sort of travel in North Africa or anything, you, you'll see donkeys abused as beasts of burden. I, I've had, you know, been in situations where, where a donkey had taken a cart down a sand dune and it, the thing was underneath, bless it, and you're trying to get it off and bridge it off. And well, that donkey is, you know, too much has been laid on that poor donkey's cart. 
doesn't it? And the, the poor dog, he's marvellous. There are a lot of sermons that do that. Because they're not saying, look, you've got to bear fruit for God, right? But it depends on your union to the rootstock, not on try harder. Not on overloading them, the cars at the back of the donkey, the donkey leg has any head to in this. Apparently, it's not funny. Not funny, it's really cruel. But you see the point. So, we're looking at the graft and the bearing of fruit because of the union with Christ, and we're not looking at overburdening the cart. Fruit. What does it look like, this fruit? What is the fruit of discipleship to Christ? The church? Yeah, uh, this is this, I'm, not, I'm not setting up a parody here. What is this fruit? Oh, we've got a big church. Amazing audio visuals. Absolutely. Great music, lots of cool people, celebrities with corporate and executive pastors with well styled hair. <laughs> Good lighting, wearing fashionable clothing. Yeah, that's a sign of a blessing of God, that isn't it? Absolutely. I came across and I've got to share this with you. Look at this. Have you seen this? <laughs> the kitchen up. Okay. okay, it's a US based website. But it, it actually is a website that, that exists to address fashion and the preacher. Called pasta, pastafashion.com. Go on, have a look, but make sure you laugh because otherwise you'll cry. It is incredible. But even this week, I've discovered a situation that I'm aware of where finally a pastor's been able to deal with the situation where his elders are telling him not only what he's got to preach, but what he's got to wear when he does it. Now, this is crazy. This is not a sign of the blessing of God. This is not what this fruit looks like. What happens is you stay grafted in the vine and he sends the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus sends to his people, coursing through the people of God like sap through the vine, and it is the Spirit's fruit that gets born on the ends of the branches. And this helps us to understand what the fruit Jesus is talking about like that is like then, because it will be the fruit that the Spirit engenders in the people of God. And that's described for us in Galatians 5.22. And these are values that are not generally put at much of a premium in the church. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Do you know the song? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, that. patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Who believed that? I mean, who believed that last one? So there it is. God is all those things in abundant measure. They're his characteristics, his personality traits, and wouldn't we all want to be like that list of things there? So we maintain that graph, we maintain that relationship to Jesus Christ, and he flows his life, his personality traits, his characteristics, and so on into us, and we change from what we've been progressively to reflect his handiwork in, in healing, hurt, and human, harm, harm to human, human beings. So, so here's how he's glorified. As the life of God flows into and changes hurt, damaged human beings, there's fruit. And that shows how glorious he is that he can do a thing like that. Does that make any sense? Looks like you have to be back. Are they all right? I'll be done by 12. I'll be done by the end of coffee time. <clears throat> so that's the fruit. That is what the fruit is. But Jesus says much of it. It's my Father's glory that you bear. Not a little fruit, but much. The Greek text here doesn't say, in this is my Father glorified that you bear fruit. It says, in that you bear much fruit. Much fruit. And we are sometimes satisfied if we're not careful with a little bit of God in our life. Is that true? It's Monday tomorrow. School. Yes, yeah, school. Mm -hmm. Is God coming to school? God's everywhere. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, having him big in Monday is harder than having him big in Sunday. And it's easy to be satisfied with a little bit. Disciples aren't satisfied with a little bit of him. Disciples think he's really cool. We think he's really amazing. And we want him close up and personal, not far off and occasional. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of faith, a little bit of walking with God, just a little bit of spiritual fruit, but not too much, you know, we're British. Right? It's not enough. But this is my Father glorified. You bear much fruit. 
How does that glorify by half-hearted cold spirit in mini pot yogurt to slow down? Do you know they make those little mini pots of yogurt? Have you seen those? The ones that are really good for you. Why do you reckon they're in mini pots? I think it's because they're absolutely disgusting. Is that, is that good? They're really turn your stomach. Because if you have too much, then it's bad for you. Oh, well, that's a very rational thought, but my thought is more fun. I think, and it makes this point. If something is good for you, you want, you want a fair bit. I mean, if you love him, if you mean it, if you can see the good of all he's got for you, a lost sinner saved by grace, then you'll be mad keen on going through in space, won't you? Let me give you an illustration. <coughs> David came up on uh, one night this week, Thursday, perhaps, was it? Mm -hmm. And uh, being a mad keen, you know, he's, he's a GP triathlete, right? Kind of thing, so he's mad keen on his sport, he's fanatical. And uh, I just happened in an unguarded moment, so let's say, I thought, oh, I'll do something about like getting on that turbo, on that bike, and get a bit more exercise. You know? I was thinking like 15 minutes, twice, three times a week. No, 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 no. David, before I knew it, David just sketched out a plan. <laughs> oh yeah, every day of the week. So an hour, he said. What, all week? No, an hour every day, all week. <laughs> Where am I going to get an hour? Anybody can find an hour if they're serious about it. Okay, fair enough. And he not just said, get on the bike and ride it. Or give me handful of suggestions like, you could listen to this on your headphones while you do it, or something. He, he worked out, do five minutes, gentle, then... Five minutes hard, then 15 minutes medium, and then, you know, for each, and different all through the week. No chance. It's too much. Petrol in it. No, I'm not. Petrol in it, yeah. I'll invite you to petrol in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. He loves his bike. He loves his triathlon. He loves all that serious training stuff. And, and because he loves it, because he loves being a race fit competition athlete, much of it. Can you see the difference in attitude between him and me? <laughs> How much have I got to do? How much can I get away with? <laughs> you know? David's attitude is that hours putting power through the turbo trainer is great. He loves it. And my attitude is that this is excessive, extravagant, waste of time and energy because I don't value it. But what glorifies God, says Jesus, is that you, his disciples, bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Again, look, fruit, much fruit, bearing fruit. Not generating fruit, not creating fruit, not energizing the process in any way except turning from sin to trust and follow Jesus and then bearing fruit as the life of God comes pouring through. I went searching through Google and Flickr and so on at this point for a photo of someone sticking plastic fruit on a conifer or, or even onto a fruit tree of some description. Right? And it's all about as ridiculous as this, what we're talking about. <laughs> Look, somebody's found a privet bush and they've stuck plastic fruit on it. And it just, just strikes me as a little ver visual parable of so much of what goes on. It's like sticking plastic pulling fruit on a privet bush. And it's such a contrast with what Jesus is talking about. Yeah, you see it for a laugh sometimes, a bit of a joke against the keen gardener who just can't get a pineapple to fruit or something, or a fig tree or a walnut tree who won't do anything because something wants to stick some banana on it. Um, <laughs> It's the fruit of discipleship we're looking for. It's the fruit of that graft that's there that we're looking for. It's the fruit that is the produce of the spirit sap rising in somebody as somebody is grafted into that vine and pays attention to keeping the graft clean and healthy and strong. So the fruit is not made, worked out or innovated by that person but grows on them out of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as his characteristics, his personality become manifest. Through faith alone. Drawing daily on the life of God that is so evidently coursing through us. It's, it's that sustained relationship with Christ that does it. It's remaining in the vine. It's living a life of determined repentance and faith and going to Him day by day that bears fruit for God, carried on the outstretched arms of a repentant, trusting sinner's life. And it's not plastic fruit standing in a pretty bush. That's where following Jesus takes you. Rather than following a religion or a philosophy or a culture, and that's when you find fruit born of you. Now, what's the Spirit's role in that? Whatever our doctrinal predilections, worship preferences, personality types, we simply must forget that the primary role in fruit production is down to the sap that flows through the vine. 
And it would be easy to read a verse like this, where Jesus says, It's my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It would be easy to read a verse like that, filter it through the natural Phariseeism of our human nature, and end up with a poked and deadly brew of fierce legalism that would crush the soul, beat the brow, burn the broken backs, and lift the donkey off the ground. It's not good, it's not right, it's not true. This go and bear fruit message is not a try harder to be good message. Making that out of it is a travesty. <clears throat> a number of years ago, I went back to college for a year reunion after a, a long time away. It felt like ages, it's been longer since. And meeting up with a girl there that I, I, I knew, as a, she'd married and everything, at college, and she was a well, teen Roman Catholic then. She used to go to the chapel and see them whatever well. And of course, as she'd gone off into life, she'd got more and more involved in the Catholic parish and so on. I said, how are things, you know? Um, obviously, a Roman Catholic family, uh, they're called Madeline, you know, so obviously there's a background. And uh, there we go. And I said, how are things? How's it going? I said, oh, good. Said, how's, how's, how's church, tentatively? You know? How's the church? You know, let's find out if there's a doorway and if it's open. Uh, it wasn't. And uh, just chatting, she said, oh, I've got a really good priest now. She said, I've had a few problems, but we never I said, great, that's excellent. What's, you know, this whole, there's been a Vatican too. What, what's up? I go along and she said, she, he, he speaks so gently and quietly. He, he asks us to try harder. And I, I think he asks so nicely. I think, maybe I will. <laughs> and, and again, you've got donkeys with carts and their legs are off the ground. So they can't engage with it too closely because it's too much of being us. And Jesus says, this is for my father's glory. You bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples.